New to the world, fresh out the barrio. I was an outlaw, a rebel, out of my mind, young and wild. My existence defined in one word, survive. In the 1960s, America endured a period of immense ethnic tension, as different organizations rose to combat notable social issues and civil rights violations. Chicago boasted the presence of a multitude of cultures within its borders. However, the city government's partiality towards upper-class citizens allowed for the interests of the existing lower class to be overlooked despite public protests and organized resistance. Government suppression of the Puerto Rican young lords in Lincoln Park resulted in the displacement of an entire community in favor of young, white professionals. Further, the gentrification caused a diaspora of Puerto Rican families, destroying the fabric of the diverse community. The conflict between the young lords and city government's urban renewal efforts reveals government unwillingness to compromise with lower classes when faced with opportunities for profit. Initially, Lincoln Park was an industrial Puerto Rican migrant community. Puerto Rico's economic decrepitude forced many Puerto Ricans to emigrate to the U.S. in search of jobs. Many of these people settled in Chicago, having been recruited by companies as low-wage, non-union foundry workers, as well as domestic workers in hotels and private homes. Many settled in Lincoln Park because of its cheap housing prices and close proximity to the city where these jobs were located. As the Puerto Rican neighborhood expanded, the Young Lords developed as a street gang. At their formation in the early 1960s, they behaved like any other turf gang, engaging in criminal and often violent activities. Simultaneously, the city government had its eyes on Lincoln Park, the home of the Young Lords, as it was in prime proximity to the city and inhabited by a lower socioeconomic class. Mayor Daly's urban renewal program sought to raise the wealth and therefore the tax base of the neighborhood. Realtors knew they could get two to four times the present rents from rich people, and the urban renewal program promoted by the Lincoln Park Conservation Association wanted property values to increase. A man from Bissell Realty said that he has nothing against Puerto Ricans. Moving them out is just good business. He can make a lot more money renting to rich whites. Many working class families simply happen to be, quote, living over a gold mine. Having realized the economic potential of the Lincoln Park neighborhood, Chicago's government decided that it was essential that the city's urban renewal budget be allocated to its development. However, the development of high-rent residences would inevitably increase the housing prices and rent in the neighborhoods, forcing the Puerto Rican industrial workers to find affordable housing elsewhere. I live here from 1966 to 1969. Then in 1969 we moved. This one man asked us, uh, he'll pay us some money to move out of this house. Because somebody else wanted to live here, you know, wanted to remodel the place. Despite the Young Lord's proposal that 40% of the urban renewal budget be spent on low-income housing, the Lincoln Park Conservation Association set aside only 15%, the federally required minimum. After the association's announcement of their plan, the Lords vowed to disrupt any open meeting held to rally support for urban renewal. In July 1969, several council meetings were interrupted when young lords stormed the stage and refused to allow the agenda to be implemented. So we go into the urban renewal meeting, and, and they got about three or four men up there in the front uh, from the neighborhood association, and uh, and they're the ones making the decisions for our community, and they're all white. I mean, and they're all male. You know what I'm saying? So uh, from now on, you cannot meet in this neighborhood until you got black, poor, white and Latino representation on your board. The Young Lords engaged in many political demonstrations in effort to stall the urban renewal movement, including, quote, taking over the 18th District Chicago Avenue Police Workshop meeting and informing the audience that the Young Lords and their programs have been instituted to protect and serve the community. We went into the police station and the meeting was upstairs. Right now we planned to close the doors and we took over the meeting and told the seniors, you don't have to be afraid of us. We, in fact, we want you to come to the People's Church. You're invited, you're our guests. And, and, and you know, we made the point that we, they did not have to fear us. We were there to serve them. This, as well as other incidents, led to even greater friction with Chicago's police force and government. In 1969, the Young Lords demonstrations reached a turning point, the occupation of the Presbyterian McCormick Theological Seminary. 
Shortly before midnight on Wednesday, May 14, the new Stone Academic Administration Building at McCormick Seminary was occupied by a group of 60 to 70 men, women, and children from the Lincoln Park area, representing various community organizations united in a poor people's coalition. During the occupation, the Young Lords publicized that cities attempt to displace Puerto Ricans from the Lincoln Park community and charged that the seminary was complicit in this displacement. The Young Lords demands that the seminary provide funds for low-income housing in the community, a children's center, a cultural center for Latin Americans, and legal assistance. And what we ask you for is for space, that's all. We will supply the manpower, we will supply the food for the children. All we ask is for the space of this church and this community. After five days of occupation, the Lords received a call from Texas saying that $600,000 had been allotted for low-income housing in Lincoln Park. Further, the aid convinced the Board of Urban Renewal to meet demands for housing, including the allocation of 40% of the urban renewal budget for low-income housing. McCormick pledged to publicly oppose the racist policies of urban renewal, help community groups, and open its facilities for public use. This unprecedented action proved that political minorities could be heard prompting many Puerto Ricans previously on the fence to give their support and loyalty to the YLO. The organized resistance of the Young Lords threatened the city's mission to develop a high-income neighborhood. The YLO, at the time, were taking measurable actions to increase their political influence in the city. Their leader, Chacha Jimenez, had already forged several alliances with other activist groups, such as the Chicago Black Panther Party. This alliance gained the Lords the support of not only the Puerto Rican community, but the African American and radical civil rights movements as well. Mayor Daley realized that the Young Lords formed the sole resistance to his urban renewal plans, and in order to discredit the Lords, Daley and the city of Chicago adopted new policies around the war on gangs. Daley proposed to put 1,000 more police officers on the streets by the following year, as well as increasing the officers in the gang intelligence unit from 37 to 200. Daly's goal was to monitor and restrict operations like the YLO, and he was successful in doing so. Not only were the Young Lords' efforts stifled by local government, but their notorious reputation as a street gang, as well as their alliance with the Panthers, garnered the attention of the FBI's COINTELPRO, or Counterintelligence Program. The objective of COINTELPRO was to identify and undermine organizations that were so-called threats to national security through covert operations. Initially set on the infiltration into communist groups during the Cold War, COINTELPRO was credited with the elimination of dozens of civil rights groups during the 1960s and 70s, both violent and nonviolent. Unfortunately for the Young Lords, city government and the FBI's surveillance of their actions resulted in the arrest of key leaders in the Young Lords organization, including Jimenez, on several counts of petty crimes including jaywalking and conspiracy to commit violence when preaching to a group of supporters. The city government also enforced housing codes to shut down the operation of the Young Lords Food Drive and Children's Shelter. The reason why we haven't been able to open a daycare center is because the city has found uh, ridiculous violations in the building, such as the uh, floor is too low, the ceiling is too high. By 1971, the organization's demise was in full swing. The institutionalized incarceration of integral Young Lord members led to a lack of leadership, resulting in poor management of the community programs that earned the Lords Puerto Rican support. FBI efforts to silence and scatter the Lord's resistance led to decreased support in the Puerto Rican community, allowing the Department of Urban Renewal to continue the gentrification of Lincoln Park unchecked. After the urban renewal movement, most of the Puerto Rican community could no longer afford to live in Lincoln Park, and they were consequently forced to relocate to Humboldt Park, which the city branded an economic dead zone due to low housing prices and a shortage of commercial retail spending. Although the Young Lords themselves were ultimately unsuccessful in preventing urban renewal, their resistance laid the groundwork for activism within minority communities. The impact of the Young Lords is also evident in contemporary politics and activism. Until the 1970s, Latinos had been kept out of Chicago politics, but by 1975, three Latinos had been elected to public office, a number that has been increasing ever since. Lastly, organizations such as the Puerto Rican Cultural Center and the Puerto Rican Students' Unions are just a few examples of groups that drew inspiration from the dissident stances of the Young Lords. Despite organized resistance, the Young Lords failed to preserve their community due to government suppression, showing the unwillingness of Chicago's government to compromise with political and social minorities.